Good evening and welcome. This is Jennifer Reynolds. If you can hear me, if you are hanging out at home on an evening time and are delighted to escape the madness for a little bit, uh, shoot a question, raise your hand, let me know you're alive out there. My attendee list, oh, I see some hands going up. That's a red hand and a question. I like what I'm seeing. We have 38 folks joining us this evening and I think there's more than one of us that would love a little escape. Valerie, delighted that you're here this evening. For those of you, Andrea Boyd, Andrea, you and I, we have some plans, girl. We need to get to France together. Friends, when all this is behind us, we have a ton of travel to do. And for an hour tonight, I want you to grab a drink. I want you to get a snack, sit back, and we're going to go someplace every evening tonight and at this time until the end of the month and we'll see what happens at the end of the month tomorrow night we're going to go to the antarctic i'll share that with you later after that i don't know i got a few ideas up my sleeve so we're going to start on the hour give me about 30 seconds to get organized here and i'm really happy y'all have joined me Lisa, Valerie, Alina, Brandon, Carolyn, Carrington, Michelle, Sabine, Ben, Brenda, Charles. Who else do I have? Darlene, oh, Deb Muir. Hello, my friend. Deb Marsh. Oh, more folks have come in here. This is Maine. Fantastic. San Dan, Virginia, my neighbor, Virginia, down the street. I'm so happy, Virginia, you're here. Welcome. Well, good evening, everyone. And my name is Jennifer Reynolds. I live in Tampa, Florida. And like the rest of you, uh, a rather unusual world that we're in right now, and I thought it might be really fun to escape it for a little while. To escape it every evening at 7 o'clock to maybe sit down and instead of tuning into the news, um, tune in to some travel, some arms for travel. My name is Jennifer Reynolds. I have worked and lived in travel for a very long time. In fact, it's the only business, it's the only industry that I know um, I grew up, was born and raised in Canada, in Toronto, Canada. I now call Tampa, Florida home. I spent over 18 years living uh, and working on board cruise ships. Believe it or not, I was part of a duo juggling Magic Act before running a short excursion department and traveling on worldwide itineraries throughout the world for Regency cruises. I did some a uh, number of years with Silver Sea Cruises. Last year in May, I had a chance to go to Africa. Chances are that's one of the escapes that we'll look after and we'll, uh, we'll think about doing during this month. Up there on the right-hand side was a photograph in Melbourne, Australia from Christmas two times ago. And one of my all-time number one favorite journeys is right there in the middle in December of last year when I went down to the Antarctic. And I think maybe tomorrow night, if you want to join me a little bit, we'll talk more about that. But I've always worked in travel. I've always lived in travel. It's kind of the only thing that I've ever really done. Having worked on cruise ships and now working for a company called the Scenic Group, we have river cruises uh, throughout the world. And I thought it would be a really fun hour to take a look at river cruising. Where river cruising in Europe and a few other spots go to, what it means to river cruise. And I think we have a real cross blend of folks with us tonight on our little travel escape. I got people who are travel agents, some people who have been on river boats, some people who never have. So I think we should just all kind of fasten our seatbelts and see what it's like to be on board a river cruise. About 45 minutes with me here tonight. I am recording the session. If you have any questions, pop them down here. I love history, I absolutely love geography, and I want you to leave feeling like this is something that you may want to do, you may want to escape to, or if you have already escaped to it, you go back to it for a little while tonight. But riverboats are really very interesting. There are hundreds of them that are plying the rivers of Europe, if you will. But riverboats are really very simple. At the end of the day, I often liken what you're looking at to a car. When you look at a riverboat, they are going to have a bunch of cabins, a main deck, a, a dining room, a lounge, and that's pretty much it. Kind of the river of what you're looking at here is the significance of um, 
what you find in river cruising where it's very easy to do the rivers are easy to navigate you never have to worry about seasickness there's just tons of eye candy if you will on all sides of it but you know where river cruising goes and what it does is kind of neat and i think you have to look at a map to really understand uh the european river model and i'm i'm going to grab my spotlight here and try to show you a few things the Rhine, the Mine, and the Danube, and we're going to look at each of these rivers so you can understand them a little bit better. Uh, the Rhine River actually starts here in the mountains of Switzerland, and it goes down river through Strasbourg, and it ultimately makes its way out to the Black Sea, actually at Rotterdam in, uh, in Holland. Uh, this is a really neat river. It's a fast-moving river. It's very close to the mouth of the ocean. So many years ago, it held a, a tremendous amount of traffic. The Danube River is also something that's known to many folks. The Danube starts here in Germany. The Danube really kind of begins its life for us in Nuremberg, if you will, in Germany. And give me a minute and I'll explain further. But going down river through Regensburg and Passau, passing through over 10 countries, Vienna into Budapest, and then finally into the lower Danube here, and finally dumping in all the way at the Black Sea. But there's something really interesting that happens right here on this squiggle line, if you will, between Bamberg, Germany, and right over here, the River Rhine. And that's called the Rhine Mine Danube Canal. And this canal was opened in 1992. Now, don't think the idea of a canal was something new. Mm. Charlemagne had wanted to do this going back centuries, but it was only completed in 1992. And truth be told, that is what makes traveling all the way up from up here in Amsterdam, from the North Sea, all the way to the Black Sea possible. Part of that is on the Rhine, part of that's on the canal, and part of that's on the Danube. And we're gonna look at a little bit of itineraries and what makes that so neat. There's three rivers that people love to travel in France. We forget about going from Paris up to Enfleur and the Normandy beaches here, a really neat experience. Bordeaux, in this area of France, for anyone who wants to eat and drink their way around, and also the southern part of France here. Uh, tonight, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey down through Portugal. It's such a, a beautiful, beautiful place. It's so subtle. It's so gentle. And lots of people will go there and combine it with Lisbon. And yes, I'm also going to take you a little bit over to Russia, uh, over to this part. Because you know why? People who cruise, people who travel. People who love history and geography like you and me, we go to places like Russia. So we're going to look at those together tonight. So when I look at river cruising and I look at the rivers themselves, let me get that slide to advance. It looks like I have to take that drawing tool off. It's not going to let me do many things. River cruises, I liken them to a car. They've got three decks, a main deck, a dining room, and a lounge, a bunch of cabins. Just like your cars in a parking lot are going to have doors, a roof, a hood, a trunk, an engine, but are you driving a Mercedes Benz or are you driving something a little bit more humble? Most are going to have three decks. They'll have some balconies. Uh, you'll find lounges that are, are kind of contemporary and upscale. You'll have others that are a little bit more funky and have a different feel and style to them. But all of them are long. All of them are kind of narrow, all river boats. And again, there's hundreds of them have these beautiful floor-to-ceiling glass windows. A dining room and food is generally all included. There's a, a myriad of options that are available. And for you travelers out there, that's why you talk to our travel agent partners. But by and large, when you look at a river cruise, you're going to get your daily accommodation, your meals, a tour may be included, a wine, beer, and soft drinks may be included, your Wi-Fi. Uh, there's a, a bunch of ways of doing things. And the thing is, you just can't make a bad choice when you're looking at the rivers. Uh, most ships will carry anywhere from 160 to 200 people. And it's a matter of the feel on board, the style, whether you're going contemporary, traditional. And then, of course, looking at your cabins. 
something like this is always what we would call an entry level cabin on a riverboat. Kind of doesn't matter what you're doing. Those windows up there, we call them swan windows. And probably because that's about the only view you're going to have out the window is going to be one of the swans going by. Uh, but again, most of the river boats are going to have slippers, you're going to have robes and amenities are included and waters included. Most of the time, if you're looking for a floor to ceiling glass window and a quote balcony, this is kind of where you'd be. But I need you to rethink that word balcony. You know, on river boats, like on every cruise, we've really got to make sure that we make use of every single nook and cranny. A balcony, you might go to the edge of your room, open the door, step outside, close the door. Well, we don't want to lose that square footage. And this is pretty much for everybody on the rivers. Many of us have what's called panorama balconies, floor to ceiling glass windows that operate at the push of a button. The space isn't wasted. You can pull across a little privacy panel so someone can read outside while others uh, maybe watch television or get ready for the evening activities. They're really, really very lovely. The views are, are phenomenal. There's no such thing as an inside cabin. And well, in my world, I just don't think there is a way to lose. Uh, no matter what you choose on the rivers, it's just a matter of something really being different. Uh, now, suites are on the upper end. This is an example of some of the suites that you'll find. Many of them are large, and uh, the more ships that we get out on the river and the more options that there are available. Um, funny to say this, but these big suites are the ones that sell first. So when you hear the terminology, we sell from the top down, it's because that uh, most of the time or very often the suites, for people who are picky, they'll wait uh, to get the suites that they want. Now, some riverboat companies are going to have butlers and some aren't. Um, this is the magic of the rivers is choosing what works for you. But everything is drawing your eye outdoors. Notice how it's the floor to ceiling glass windows, cups of tea, the ability to drink lots of water, walk around the decks. Some river boats have swimming pools on them. And what you're looking at there is the bridge. And I mean the bridge where the captain is. And sometimes as we go down the rivers, uh, we actually drop the railings on the upper deck and also the awnings. And where the bridge is, retract into the deck that you see there because we need every single inch to get through some of the bridges. And you'll see that on some of the images that we look at. Amenities abound, it depends on what you choose. Yep, there are uh, spas on board, and I'm not talking ridiculously expensive options either on river boats. It's a pretty common factor to be able to go and get a, a pedicure or a manicure. Uh, gyms, small gyms, everything is in a, a nice little uh, compact fashion when you look at a river boat. Um, yoga is often done on deck. People love to get active. After all, when you get out into these ports of call, some of them, especially in Europe, are a little on the demanding side. And this is something that people really need to understand when you're traveling in Europe. These are small, sometimes big cities, many of them medieval with sidewalks and interesting things that we have to navigate. And it's these cruise ships, or I should use the term river boats, because they're really not a cruise ship. It's a river boat, again, between 160 to 200 people with different amenities on board. Some of them with swimming pools. Look at that infinity pool that is on board Emerald Riverways, Emerald Waterways here. And that actually converts into a cinema in the evening time. And I'd like you to steer that image in your mind for a moment is a little later on as we come down river towards some places in Austria, I want to share a little story with you, but this cinema becomes a really neat little activity area. And my point is there's bars, there's cinemas, there's get togethers, there's kitchens, there's dining, there's drinks. That's what river cruising is really all about. And it's just an option of so many ways to be able to travel, to get out, to explore our world. Now, again, I shoot up an image. 
of a riverboat, cabins, a main dining room, a lounge, a deck upstairs. You can just see the top of where the captain would be, where it would retract into the deck should they come across a very narrow bridge, perhaps at high water. Imagine having lunch outside on the decks here. Bicycles are included on most of the river boats. In fact, some of the excursions that you'll see uh, are also including walks or visits to vineyards simply by nature of the kind of places uh, that you're going to be going to. But I'm going to pick up my little highlighter again here only because I think Really understanding the geography really makes a big difference. And we're going to look at some itineraries and a bit more maps. But when we look at the Rhine River from Basel in Switzerland, and I start in the mountains, from the mountains to the sea, um, the Rhine River is just really, really exquisite. It was a, a very interesting time in history. It was a, a focal point of trade. So it's a really busy river. There's a lot of wineries and things along the side of it, lots of eye candy. Going a bit further down, we'll head down to the Danube as well. Looking in the Bordeaux region, there's one in, in uh, France. There is Paris to Enfleur on the Seine, southern part over here in France. And then, of course, Porto in uh, Portugal. And we will take a look over here, a little bit of Russia mostly because I'm, a, I think, a little bit of a Russian history junkie. But knowing these um, rivers and understanding them a little bit are really going to help you when it comes to making a decision about where you want to go and what you want to do. A 14-day itinerary from Amsterdam to Budapest would look pretty much like this. You're going to start on the Rhine River. You're going to go through the rhine mine danube Canal. You'll jump onto the Danube. And then it'll ultimately take you down into Budapest. You're going to hit at least 10 countries along the trip here, including Germany, Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, Croatia, Moldova, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, and the Ukraine is where the Danube River will take you if we went all the way out to the Black Sea. Let's take a look at something starting up in Amsterdam on the Rhine is Amsterdam is a really popular ju jumping off point for people, whether it's in the spring. Mm. And I'm also going to encourage you to think about that time of the year, even in the winter time because of the uh, markets, the Christmas markets that take place. But you know, the Netherlands would never even exist were it not for the Dutch waterworks that control all of the water. Um, in this area and all of the water flows and you know the story of the little dutchman and this is where so much of it really begins in holland holland is is a um very famous of course for its tulip time in holland a lot of winter carnival takes place here as well a lot of the christmas markets and it's a fabulous jumping off point to start going uh down river and get going on some of these trips Springtime in Holland and Belgium is generally an April, May period of time. The, the area is always going to be a little bit cooler because tulips need to be cold in order for them to be able to bloom. You may have heard of Kuchenhof Gardens. Most itineraries when they're in Amsterdam will visit Kuchenhof Gardens because of the density and the beauty of the flowers that exist here. But think about yourself coming out of Amsterdam heading actually upriver uh, on the Rhine, making our way towards the Danube. Lots of stops are gonna be made along the way. Meals are gonna be supplied on board, but you're gonna need to be walking a lot of these calories off. We don't have these kinds of shops here. Panera here doesn't look anything like this. These are bakeries that are everywhere. I was constantly buying little things and bringing those sweets back to my room or noshing on things during the day because you're gonna be in port. There's some of the small places that you're going to be able to see, like Regensburg. Small little villages and towns. Look at that Wi-Fi available here. Uh, take a bite of lunch here. The majority of your meals are, of course, included on board the ship. But that's one of the beauties of doing a river cruise. You get an opportunity to really explore and really see these places. Now, I spent 18 years of my life living and working on board a cruise ship, 
And one thing we always said about cruise ships was that they take you to a country. And river cruising takes you through a country. And I show the example of the uh, Danube and Rhine River in front of you in the map that you can see. Uh, look at the blue from Rotterdam on the Mine River, the little black spot from Bamberg to Nuremberg, which is the Rhine Mine Danube Canal. And then as you go a little bit further down from Klenheim, you continue down through Slovakia, through Hungary, all the way down through Bulgaria, and you can continue all the way out into the Black Sea. And we'll go from Bulgaria all the way out here. This doesn't happen without a lot of effort. You're going through 10 countries here on the Danube itself. There's a tremendous amount of locks. Uh, the Rhine-Main Danube Canal itself is over 100 miles or 100, kilometers, 100 miles long, 106, right here that you're going to transit to get through, to get further upriver. So this is pretty interesting stuff, and it's because of that geography and because of this that we're able to uh, transit. And in fact, in some places, you're up as high as 1,200 feet. There's 16 locks and just over 1,200 feet at the highest point where you're actually coming over what they call the Continental Divide in Europe. This is right outside of Nuremberg and I love this image because it shows you Nuremberg in the distance. And look at that waterway that is sailing, that waterway that you can see traveling here in front and then the roadway that is passing immediately behind it. It's because of this, it's because of these engineers that we have roads, that we have these canals that allow us to explore the rivers that we do. So not only were these the trade routes, it's these kinds of things that connect the rivers through lock systems that take you up or down 1,200 feet. And if that sounds a little bit like the Panama Canal, then you're absolutely right because it's exactly the same kind of thing. On the Danube, 19 locks, 15 of them between Regensburg and Vienna. I'm always surprised when people don't know that there's locks uh, on a river to help them get through. Just like on the Great Lakes from Lake Ontario up to Lake Erie, that distance of Niagara Falls are done by a series of locks. The Rhine there at the bottom, has a total of 12 locks, and two of them are just outside of Basel. So there's a lot of magic that's going on in these rivers, a lot of amazing things on the Mine Danube Canal with 16 locks itself. So this is some interesting stuff, and these are things that are gonna be talked about as you're on the canal. It's and as you're on the rivers, because it's now places like Würzburg that'll be open up to you. Uh, the Musical Museum on the right-hand side, Notice the sense and the feeling of some things will be gothic, lots of medieval towns. And I dig this time of the world at Christmas time. Now, the Christmas markets in Europe, they start around the November period of time. And I love it because in this time of the year, you can go from simplicity to really very complicated itineraries. And these are some images that I took from my journey on the Christmas markets two years ago. This was up in Amsterdam, in the upper end in Amsterdam, a couple of days later, just outside of Regensburg. And then as we got a little bit further down river, that's my colleague, Troy, and we were all enjoying our fair share of blue wine around the river. Uh, we really enjoyed the Christmas markets because they were between the Christmas time uh, right after our Thanksgiving up until December. And these are the kinds of things that we saw from the river. We saw castles, castles once that where nobility lived, castles once that stopped ships and would collect tolls as ships would go by. Uh, going down river, look at this, where two rivers will come together. I'm grabbing my spotlight to show you two riverboats tied up here in a position called rafting. When we talk to you about walking in Europe and the ability to get around because riverboats raft like this, meaning they dock side by side, sometimes you have to walk through another riverboat, which will mean up a set of stairs and across another one and down another set of outdoor stairs. And you may go and do some touring and come back and discover that your little riverboat has sailed around and maybe repositioned himself right over the other side. 
uh, that's okay. Uh, don't worry yourself about that. River cruising is significantly less structured than ocean cruising. If you've done a tremendous amount of ocean cruising, you've been sailing with thousands of people. Here you're sailing with hundreds of people. Things are a bit more relaxed. We tend to dock very, very close to activities. And in fact, there's many itineraries where you'll hit more than one port during a daytime. Uh, this was one of my favorites because we went up to Milk Abbey, toured Milk Abbey in the morning, just a fabulous morning. And then an opportunity to jump on some bicycles and sail. And uh, those who didn't want a bicycle did the sail downstream. And those of us that did want to do the bicycle, off we pedaled a bunch of miles to go and catch up with, with the ship. But there's just so much to see here. And there's a lot of big cities. Um, there are also a lot of small towns. And folks, you know, when you look at itineraries from this year to next year, my promise is there's not going to be any new medieval cities between now and then. Um, we do have people who go back and repeat itineraries because you may not be able to visit both places in one. You may have to choose. There's Salzburg over there on the right-hand side. Uh, or choosing between itineraries in Vienna. You may have one day there. Do you want to do a walking tour? Do you want to go and see the city? Do you want to go see the horses? So sometimes we'll get people who are going to repeat the places that they go. And the Sound of Music cult that follows us down the river is fantastic. And I promise you, everybody who goes to Salzburg somehow manages to be coming back, singing the Sound of Music at the sound of the top of their voice. And I promised you earlier the story about this little theater. We play the sound of music in the evening time very often on board this, on board our emerald ship. We also include wine, beer, and soft drinks with our lunch and dinner. And it is magnificent to discover how many folks have such a magnificent time in Austria that they will be singing at the top of their lungs to the sound of music when we play that in our theater here in the evening time. I thought it was only the kids who knew all the words from one to the end, but I've discovered that we adults are just as good at it as many of the children. But there's just not a bad seat in the house. Uh, boats may dock on one side of the river, they may move and, and switch over to the other side. You're looking at uh, a riverboat there in, in front of Budapest, um, and going from Nuremberg downstream in Nuremberg to Vienna is a classic seven-day itinerary. And what we looked at a little bit earlier was from Amsterdam all the way down to Vienna. And you'll find this section from Vienna to Nuremberg or Nuremberg up to Amsterdam. Those seven-day itineraries are generally a lot more common. Uh, pretty much everybody's got bikes on board. If you want to do any kind of bike riding, if they don't, you'll be able to get them easily in all of the places you go. Uh, some include tours. You can buy tours locally as well. And man, when you got this kind of eye candy sitting out your window in the evening time when you're having dinner or popping into a little bit of culture in Vienna and taking in a theater, as many folks will do, um, these are pretty extraordinary moments, and these really are the times that stay with us for a long period of time. But when you're looking at the rivers, it's really important, the Rhine, the Main, the Danube, that's where about 80% of people are going to go for the very first time. Um, some of the areas that are increasing in huge popularity is the Lower Danube. Uh, starting in Vienna down to Belgrade. Uh, this is really an interesting part of the world. Funny, I've discovered a lot of teachers are exploring here. These are former, former communist countries. These are places that not that long ago were not even really open to individuals or to people in general. Um, these are folks and cultures and economies that are just starting to really be open to the West. Um, so this is really neat stuff in this part of the river when you are going through the Iron Gates 
uh, on your way out to Belgrade. And that is, is something many who are travelers really want to do on their list. This is a very tricky part of the river. It's a really interesting navigation. There's quite an interesting story behind the Iron Gates and the characters here. And well, frankly, that's what a lot of us want to do when we travel. We want to go, we want to experience it, smell it, see it, taste it, and feel it. And Europe gives us a chance to do that because the ports are not that far apart. And I, I use the term ports rather loosely, but they really are. Uh, they're small ports, they're small cities, and in some cases, very significant big cities. Uh, let's take a look at the Rhine. And I point out the fact on the Rhine, I know I sound a little crazy here, but this was a focal point of trade during the time of Charlemagne. I mean, this whole area is settled because of this river, because of, of what they did on here. It's about 800 miles that is navigable and you go through six countries on this river. And there on the right hand side, I found a really interesting map from Basel in Switzerland. And then on the left hand side is Holland. Remember we talked about Holland being so reliant upon their management of water. Take that image of Holland on the left and lay it over the map of Holland in your mind on the right-hand side. Look at the waterways. Look at the things that are navigable for all of us in Holland, in Belgium, in Switzerland. That's why there's so many opportunities to choose from so many different places. Whether you want to get up into Switzerland, and this is Basel, and, you know, there was a time when this river was so polluted. Um, let me quickly go back to my notes on the Rhine. There had been a, um explosion. There it was. It used to be so polluted, there was a chemical factory fire in 1986. And that chemical factory fire was upriver, and it took only 10 days for that chemical crap in the water to flow from Switzerland all the way down to Amsterdam and out into the North Sea. All of this was cleaned up in the 1980s, in 1908, and it is actually said now that they drink out of the Rhine River. Can you imagine the drinking water comes out of the Rhine after it having been polluted? That's how they focused on getting all of that out. It's the small towns here. You're going to have a lot of evenings, a lot of overnight. There's a lot of wineries along the Rhine. The Christmas markets on the Rhine are also a really big deal from Thanksgiving to that part before Christmas. If you've ever seen that movie in Bruges, this is what Bruges looks like. And in the springtime in Holland and Belgium, that's a dynamite area to explore. And it's one of those really neat little places that gets to take advantage of all of the really teeny, teeny little waterways. But alongside there, you look at the Rhine. That's an image from the river looking up to some of the castles that existed. Notice some of the cities and some of the walking that you will need to do here. But yeah, it sure is worth it when you're sailing along the sides of the river and you've got views like that. Now we were looking at the Rhine, the Mine, and the Danube, and I want to take you uh, out of that part of Europe and pull you over to Portugal for a quick moment. Whenever we think of Portugal, most of us tend to think, I think, of Lisbon. Uh, and many of the explorers who, who came out of Lisbon and so many of them who explored and came to the West to explore. But there's something that happens on the river here on the River Douro and has been growing in popularity for the last number of years. Uh, the River Douro is a really neat little opportunity to go into Porto. Uh, and then you sail up river for seven nights and you actually come back to Porto and there's a myriad of um, places that you'll see along here actually going up to Salamanca in Spain. A lot of people who've done the Rhine, Main Danube tend to enjoy this part of the river, tend to enjoy the Duro simply because of its simplicity, simply because it is something so different than the Rhine, the Main, and the Danube. 
the southern part of France, or I should say the Bordeaux part of France, where you pretty much eat and drink your way through this part of the area. Uh, certainly it is a, about exquisitely beautiful places like Bordeaux, where you tend to go in by train from Paris and pick up any ship here. But a focus in here is always going to be on food. It will be on uh, fresh produce, on shopping with the chef possibly going out on a day itinerary to a nice little place called Arange. But here, if you don't like food and you don't like wine, uh, then probably this isn't the best itinerary for you. There's my colleague, Marc Junette, there on the left-hand side. This is a pretty neat itinerary, but it is for those that are fond of food and wine. After all, you're in a, the Bordeaux area. Uh, also an area, and you know, of course, we've the beaches of Normandy are just such an exquisite journey, particularly as we come to an end of a generation who have served and who will no longer have the opportunity to go back to the Normandy beaches. Uh, there are many vessels that sail from Paris through Giverny, Cadbec en Cove to Enfleur. And what is so special about here, this area is Giverny. Uh, this is Monet territory, my friends. This is where he did a tremendous amount of painting. Vincent van Gogh kicked out in, in these parts of the world. Uh, the riverboats here are going to be smaller, about 130-ish. Mm. Narrow, the river's narrower here than it is elsewhere. Uh, but you'll get into places you've likely heard of Rouen, which, which has the, the tapestry. And also, we'll see if I can get that one to come up. Oh, won't come up. En Fleur, one of my uh, other favorite places, En Fleur, where you dock at the end. Um, you know, it's an interesting world, and so much of what we've heard about overseas has popped up recently. And some of my favorite memories come from Cambodia and Vietnam, and I'm looking for the opportunity to get a chance to go over and visit those in the not-too-distant future. Ah! And there's my missing picture of En Fleur right there. Uh, from Cambodia to En Fleur on the northern end there of the river. Really a beautiful spot. And there's only a couple of river boats that have the ability to go under the bridge and stay alongside in En Fleur. Uh, when I ran shore excursions on board Silver Sea, we used to dock right here on the Silver Cloud. And it was pretty neat experience because it is a, an expedited journey here to get over to the, the beaches of Normandy. Russia, I want to take you over there. A few more spots I'd love to jump over to, about 10 more minutes tonight. When I think about Russia, so many people have traveled in the Baltic. They've taken a cruise in the Baltic, maybe spent some time in St. Petersburg. Uh, and St. Petersburg is absolutely magnificent, the Venice of the North. Peter the Great himself is such an interesting individual, spent a tremendous amount of time in Amsterdam. And if you see similarities between Amsterdam and St. Petersburg, it's not your imagination. It's exactly what Peter the Great did on his quest to build this magnificent merchant area. Uh, if you've been to St. Petersburg, you may have gone out to Peterhof, but Chances are few of you have had the chance to go further up the river to Kesey Island. Uh, there are seven-day itineraries that will sail from St. Petersburg to Moscow, or Moscow to St. Petersburg. But one thing I always say to folks is if anybody's traveling in Russia on a riverboat, nobody's traveling for the food or the service. For the vodka, maybe. This is pretty intense history. This is pretty neat stuff here but it's Russia. So we're going to get down and we're going to get into a lot of stuff. And these are really nice 14 day itineraries. And there is a great shot of Moscow from the river. That one's frozen. I promise you, we don't go there in the winter time, but the season for Russia really is late May, June, July, August into a little bit of September. Egypt is always interesting. Egypt had a really neat thing happen recently. If you've not read about the new Egypt Museum that has recently reopened, or I shouldn't say reopened, it has opened. It's a new build, and 
many of the items that have been unable to have been displayed in the museum in Cairo are now able to be displayed in the new museum. Uh, Egypt is, is absolutely magical and it, it's incredibly intense. It's a place that you've really got to prepare for. I think you've got to do your homework. You earn your way to Egypt. You can't show up there and expect to follow the history and catch on to everything. But you know, every time I look through my travel photos, I'm reminded of travel, how it is that it lives in our heart, that it lives in our mind, that it's all of these journeys that we keep coming back to time and time again. And that's why I pop these photos in of my husband and I, and that photo was from 2000. If you ever have thought about going to Egypt or you've ever thought about going to Petra, there's a little nugget for you to take a look at, married to a Bedouin. Look that up online. Story of a very interesting woman. She was from New Zealand. In the 1970s, she was traveling through this part of the world with a girlfriend when she was only 26. She was in Petra at that time, and this is when the Bedouins were actually living in Petra. And as a nurse, she was helping the Bedouins, and she met a gentleman. She married a gentleman, and she became a Bedouin and lived here for many years. And in fact, if any of you have ever been to Petra, it's very possible you may be familiar with her story because the gentleman she married was a souvenir seller in Petra. Uh, they successfully married. They had a number of children and the souvenir stand still exists today. So look up this story, Married to a Bedouin, and you will learn all about Marguerite and her extraordinary journey throughout the world. Because to travel really is to live. To travel for me is as important as it is to breathe. And I wanted to share with you the journey tonight and every night between now and the end of the month of somewhere. We can go, we can think about going, we can dream about going. Our rivers in Europe on the Rhine, the Mine, and the Danube. And if you're free tomorrow night around the same time, around seven o'clock, same time, same length. You don't have to change anything. I went to Antarctica last year in December, and I would love to share that experience with you. This was a 10-day journey from Ushuaia in Argentina, and I spent four days on the ice kayaking and zodiacing and just kind of hanging out and taking in Mother Nature and, uh, yeah, some pretty exquisite sights. So same time, same place. If you want to join me, tomorrow night. This is Jennifer Reynolds. Thanks for coming traveling with me. It was just important for me to get away and have a connection to others to whom travel is as important as it is to me. Thank you for wanting to join me. Come back tomorrow night and I'll let you know what other travel journeys I may have in mind for us. Follow me on Jennifer Reynolds Travels. I'd love to hear your comments, your suggestions, and if any of you had any questions, I'll answer those up there. My friends, keep traveling, keep planning, and let's explore this world together. This is Jennifer. Thanks for joining me. See you tomorrow night.